we're here at our 200th episode. Wow, that's, uh, that's been a bit of a journey. And um, today we have a very special guest who's a prominent figure in the mining industry. Mark Cafani, who's the CEO of Anglo American, one of obviously the world's biggest mining companies. Um, and in April next year, he'll be stepping down after nine years at the helm. Um, and today we have the pri privilege of spending some time with Mark to understand more about his career, his thoughts, wisdoms, and his perception of the future of the mining industry um, as we enter a new era. So without further ado, let's welcome Mark to the podcast. How are you doing, Mark? I'm very good, thanks, Rob, and congratulations on the 200 episodes. Very well done. Thank you. I, pre I pre appreciate that, and I appreciate you taking the time out to, uh, to record our 200th episode. So um, as we always start these podcasts, obviously a lot of our listeners will know you. Um, but I wondered if you can just give us a, a brief summary of your career, um, probably from when, sort of when you started started in the industry, and perhaps some things that people may not actually know about you, if you're obviously able to diverge, divulge into that. So um, I'll hand it over to you. Well, thanks, Rob. Um, I uh, grew up in a place called Wollongong in Australia, it's about 50 miles uh, south of Sydney and uh, very competitive with Sydney ciders. Um, and so we like to think that Wollongong is the intellectual capital of Australia. Uh, many of us argue the intellectual capital of the world, but that does get a rather wry smile from Sydney ciders. And when we compare ourselves to Oxford, it, it brings raucous laughter. However, we like to have fun and, and uh, we're a fun-loving group. Many English migrants, by the way, in that part of the world, uh, uh, coal mine. So I come from a coal mining region uh, and grew up and worked with a lot of uh, English uh, uh, coal miners. Uh, so, uh, and, and in fact, uh, I married uh, at uh, 22 and, and uh, my wife was uh, from Leeds. Uh, so, uh, long history and connection to English, the English. Um, look, I started uh, in the industry at 18 years of age, straight out of school. Um, I actually picked up what they call a cadetship. So, you worked during the day and you did study at night. So, I did university over six years. So, did that, uh, worked as a coal miner, literally at the face for 12 years with a company you'd know of as Rio Tinto today. Uh, so that was my first 12 years and uh, working my way through was a general manager of one of their operations uh, when I was about 28. Uh, ended up going west uh, into Western Australia in the, the gold fields and, and developed uh, uh, with a number of colleagues. I was the first general manager of uh, an operation called the Super Pit, which was Australia's largest gold mining operations uh, back in the late 80s. Uh, then worked in a number of businesses um, as a COO uh, through to being a chief executive of a company called Sons of Gwalia back in um, uh, around 2000. I then decided that uh, if I was going to further my career, career beyond that, uh, I needed to work overseas. So I went to Canada and worked for a company called Inco, and I ended up being the chief operating officer for their global operations. Uh, then I was uh, appointed Chief Executive of Anglo Gold Ashanti out of South Africa. So I then went to South Africa uh, and then most recently or nine years ago now, appointed to the Chief Executive role of Anglo-American. At that time, Anglo Gold Ashanti had been part of Anglo-American, but we took it out as a separate company. So in actual fact, um, it was a separate process that got me into Anglo-American. So here I am 45 years Almost to the day, the 13th of December is when I first started in the industry, literally as a coal miner working at the face. So uh, it's been an interesting career. I've, I've lived in four continents. I've had responsibilities across six continents and I've produced most of the elements in the periodic table in those 45 years. So it's been a blast. Yeah, Mark, really appreciate the uh, overview there. Um, was it always your intention or your dream to one day become uh, the CEO of a big mining company? Um, and I suppose, how did you prepare your mindset if that was the case? How did you prepare your mindset to sort of achieve that? Well, firstly, no, it wasn't. And, and in fact, I should ask answer one of the questions you did ask at the outset. 
is at 16, I wanted to be a professional soccer player. Right. And, and I was offered a contract in Australia as a professional at 16 uh, for the princely sum of $5 a week. And I took the contract home and said to my father that I did need his endorsement at the time. And uh, he said, don't be so bloody stupid. He said, you're going to go to school till you're 30. Uh, and this is nonsense. Now, don't forget, in Australia, there was no money in soccer. Uh, and this is one of the things they offered kids who thought they might have a bit of uh, potential. So that's where I wanted to go. But what actually happened is um, uh, I uh, was going to be a lawyer then at 18, decided I was going to do law, and I got into law in Sydney. Uh, and just before I left, uh, I met a friend who had picked up a job in mining and, and was working as a cadet, and he said it was absolutely fascinating. And the fact that you got paid uh, to work and they also helped you with your studies sounded pretty good. So that's how I got into mining uh, and uh, started as a miner and worked my way through but I never really had a, 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 a vision to be a chief executive. And when I was asked, and I still remember the question in um, the first interview, and they said, well, where do you want to go? And I said, you know, I'd, I'd like to go as far as I could. And I said, I never wanted to be in a role where I thought that was the end of the line or that's, is that all there is? And, and not being disrespectful to the role, it was, I'm always looking to further myself or do more. And so I'll take it as it comes. But uh, I never want to be in a place where I think that's the end of what I'll do. And even in retirement, you know, I'm just moving into another phase of life. So it was always thinking about what's next, what, where can you add value, can you do a good job, and what might be the next bit of progression. It was probably I got to about 30 that I decided that, gee, well, maybe I could end up as CEO of, a, of one of the major diversifieds. Then I started to think about career in a different way and started uh, making deliberate choices about jobs I took. At 40, I decided to go outside Australia and start working globally to Canada, to South Africa, now to the UK. They became more deliberate decisions as I decided and started to focus on what I thought I could do in the longer term. Yeah, I suppose you, you mentioned an important thing there. In any of the roles that you were considering, it's not about the role at that particular time. It's also the, the journey and the destination where that role could take you. And I think anyone listening to this, no matter what position that you're in, that should always you should always look at that as part of the role, not the role as it is in real time, but also in the future. Yeah, I met, I met many young kids uh, and not so young kids as well, that are always thinking about the next job. And I said to them, the best way to get to the next job is do the current job well. And one, in particular, if you're a leader, you need to make sure you focus on what you're accountable for. You need to make sure you're as good a leader as you can be for the team. You need to make sure that, that you've built trust and you have a relationship and you really are a leader, and that means listening and actually supporting your team be successful. And if you then deliver on those things and people trust you, then at the end of the day, you will be given the next opportunity. But the minute you start thinking about the next opportunity and forget your accountability and responsibility to the people that you work with, then you won't go anywhere. And I think that's a really important lesson to learn. I've learned through my career and probably still learning in many ways. Um, did you sort of any, have any mentors throughout your career? Um, and if so, what kind of advice and direction did they give? And obviously, depending what stage of career you're at, you probably have different uh, mentors as your journey progressed. Look, I, I've been very lucky. I've had uh, people that, that have provided me advice and support. Um, I've had friends, I've had leaders, I've had people who have been really tough with me um, and kicked my ass when uh, they didn't think I was doing the right thing. And, and I hope uh, I was a good listener and, and tried to apply the learnings as best I could. Um, I was asked the other day 
um, in a in an uh, Oz IMM, which is the Institute of Mining and Metallurgy for Australia, function about the 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 most remarkable leader I've worked with or for, and I, I talked about Sir John Parker as being quite unique. Um, he, he's a he's a very capable individual, very humble uh, and fantastic with people, uh, a listener, built trust, but at the same time wasn't scared to make tough calls. And for me, he, he, he epitomizes for me great leadership uh, and a very humble man that, that, you know, could be your best friend, but, but tough on you as well. Uh, great leader. My current chairman, Stuart Chambers, very, very good. He's done a great job uh, and, and following Sir John Parker, not an easy gig. And he's done a great job at Anglo-American. So I've been lucky all through my career where I've had people that have supported. There have been times when it's been a little bit tough or I might not have shared the same values uh, as my leader, but at the same time, I've always stood my ground or said my piece and invariably that's been respected. And so um, I've had a pretty good ride through my career and I've been lucky and I've, I've had opportunities and I've been very lucky. So I consider myself very lucky over the years. Yeah. And have you had mentors outside of the mining industry that may have given you a different perspective on maybe challenges that you were facing where they've had those challenges in another industry and given you advice as to how you should take that advice and apply it to the mining industry? Yeah, I, look, I've worked, I've, I've always been really fascinated with the industrial sector. And so um, there was a, a gentleman by the name of Deming that did work in Toyota uh, in the 60s and 70s, and another gentleman by the name of Elliot Jacques that did work on organisation design also with Toyota. And quite a few of the people that have worked for them, Ian McDonald, Michel Desjardins, and others who've worked in those industries and worked with IBM, worked with GE, have provided me with lots of input and insights into how other industries and companies have grown. And so one of the things I've been a champion for is what we call the industrialization of mining. And I don't mean industrialization in a negative um, uh, hi historical labor versus us type issue. It, it was more around efficiency and management of processes and supporting people, making sure people were at the centre of the operation and, and they drive the efficiencies. And you, you, you had the employees design the workplace because they have to live in it 100% of their time and making sure you're giving them the tools for them to be successful. All those sorts of things have provided a very different set of perspectives in an industry that is known to be quite traditional um, not as progressive as I think uh, the automobile sector or the um, uh, chemical sector or a whole range of new sectors. Tech sector is a great example of another level of change. So always being open to inputs and, and ideas from these sectors is, I think, as, as I think helped me uh, improve my leadership and um, focus on the things that really matter in the workplace. But again, um, the best leaders, the best advice I've got from anyone is to understand it's about people. It's not about the assets or the resources. And I don't like to talk about people as resources because that's like putting them in the same category as the buildings or the, and the minerals in mine. People are more than resources. People are the business. That is, they're the heart and the soul, make the decisions, make things work. If they trust you, if they believe you have their um, uh, future and, and their personal development at heart, then that's about building mutual trust and they'll give you the best they've got. So you've got to be a leader that deserves trust. You don't, it's not automatically given. So you've got to earn that trust. And if you can do that and build an organization or a trusting organization, then the sky's the limit. And that's come from many different places and sources. Uh, and certainly for me, made a big difference in my career. And ultimately, I hope, has made me a better leader. Which goes nicely on to my next question. Um, what are the most challenges, or what are the most difficult challenges that you faced as the CEO managing 
I suppose 90,000 odd people ever. Uh, obviously, I got that number off Google, whether that's still current. Um, to deliver the best results you can for shareholders and for the local communities that um, obviously Anglo are operating in. Um, so, yeah, just wonder what sort of difficult challenges you have ma managing such a vast amount of people. So there's always challenges and opportunities. So they're either side of the coin. Um, the first thing, when I talk about my role, I talk about it in two parts. There's the leadership role, which is about defining a purpose for the organisation. So at Anglo-American, we talk about um, uh, reimagining mining to improve people's lives. Now, those seven words, reimagine mining to improve people's lives, took us 18 months to agree. That process of bringing everyone together and, and talking about what we wanted to do, what was the difference we make? It's not just about delivering raw materials. It's about how we touch local communities and are we making a difference? How do we invest in local communities? How do we invest in new commercial ventures so that their, that community lives beyond the life of the mine? Because the resources we mine are finite. And how do we pay our way, connect with communities, COVID, and what we did with COVID was a good example. All of that stuff is about leadership, about providing a workplace and, and, a, and an organisation that people want to work for. And kids of today, more so than any generation I've ever seen, want to be part of a purposeful organisation. And then the other part of the business is about management, i.e. what structures, processes, systems do you put in place so that it encourages people to connect, work together, the processes fit together, it's all linked and coordinated and we're efficient and our costs are low and the products are high quality. All of those processes are about the management side. So leadership, management, getting those pieces right, getting the team under you, making sure the values are consistent and then let people do their job. So in reality, I only really work with on a daily basis about eight people. The next group work with eight, and so it goes. The most important people in our organisation are probably the leaders or the general managers of the operating businesses. They lead 90% of the organisation. So my job is to provide them with the support to make them successful. And if they're successful, we're successful as an organisation. And, and, and the GMs, the general managers, the people that run the mines, and they've got the team and they're in the towns and the communities and making a difference. If they're successful, if people trust them, then they trust us. And that's how we, I think, create a successful global organisation. It's about understanding your role and how you make people successful or how you help people become successful because they are the real leaders in the organisation. Yeah. Um, we spoke about, obviously, before we came on air, um, or before we start recording, about brand and image, which is obviously an issue uh, within the mining industry, or should I say from people outside of the, of the industry. But how can we as an industry sort of begin to change that perception um, and make, I suppose, the world see mining as an industry that the majority of people should even think about getting into? And obviously, before we came on, I asked you about obviously your children, whether they're coming into the industry and you said no, none of them are obviously in the industry. So, yeah, just wonder what your thoughts are moving forward around brand and image. So um, uh, there's a story I've told um, over the last few months regarding the um, rating of industry leaders um, uh, relative on a global basis, you know, who are the most respected leaders in the world, um, business, politicians, all these sorts of things. Anyway, right at the bottom of the list, you've got bankers and, and right next to them are mining engineers, or, or I shouldn't say mining engineers, I should say mining leaders. Um, and I said to, and, and most of my colleagues, myself included, are really frustrated. You know, we we provide the raw materials that help the world work. I mean, without us, you can't decarbonize. Literally, if it's not grown, it's mined. And our products make life possible. Without miners, you could literally only feed 40% of the world's population because of fertilizers and all the things we produce there. You wouldn't have the technology. You wouldn't have clean water. You wouldn't have all the things that make life possible. 
and we drive 45% of the world's economy, we use less than 0.3% of the Earth's surface to produce the products we produce. We've got the smallest environmental footprint in the world with the largest economic benefit and impact, yet people don't know that. That's our fault for not selling the message. So it's not about what we do that's the problem. It's how we do our work and how we're perceived to do our work, which is the problem. And when I say about bankers, they, they provide the money for us to live our lives. It's, and, and I don't think when I last looked, people thought that having money and being able to buy the things you need was a bad thing. But maybe there's a perception about the way they go about their work. So the both, I think both of us have got a perception problem. And so how do we explain what we do and then talk about a different way of doing things that resonates and feels like we're really partners with those communities? And, I, and we've been on a long road trying to help people understand what we do and change how we do it so that people can see that we really are making a contribution. In the last 10 years, uh, I've been uh, leading uh, meetings in the Vatican, uh, Lambeth Palace, and a whole range of other social forums with interested stakeholders on hearing their perceptions of us as an industry and trying to understand how we can change our behaviours to make a real difference. And it, it really is thrilling to see about two years ago Lambeth Palace, the Archbishop of Canterbury, came out and said, well, we've been in these dialogues, we've done the research in the Bible, we haven't been able to find a negative comment in the Bible about mining, and based on what our research and what we've seen out there and talking to these miners, uh, we've now concluded that mining is actually or could be a noble profession, and they're my words, noble profession, but only as long as if, if mining is done responsibly. So 10, 15 years ago, I think the mining industry was really seen in a very negative way. And I guess if you talk coal mining, we're probably still there, but people are starting to wake up to, they need copper, they need nickel, they need all these things to decarbonize and maybe miners are important. But the fact you've got church groups, the Vatican changing its view means that I think we're starting to deliver messages but they're also delivering a very hard message to us. You've got to change the way you operate for us to really embrace you as a partner in the future. And I think that's the job and that's a responsibility I have as a leader. And that doesn't stop when I retire. If anything, I have a responsibility to the industry that, that supported me over 45 years to make sure that we're selling that message, that people understand what we're doing. We've also got to take the hard feedback and understand how we have to adjust our behaviours to make sure that people do see us in a positive and constructive light. And that, for me, is probably the most important task I can take on beyond the retirement from Anglo-American. And that's one I'll do with great passion. And I hope it can make even a small difference. Yeah. And I suppose with the, the whole green revolution that we're hopefully moving towards, I think everyone will become more aware or more conscious of what mining is. It may take a bit of time for people to understand it, but I suppose if we're all moving towards this green, green economy, how can we get, how as an industry can we get the message out there that obviously we're, we're at the heart of it, how of the, the green revolution, what kind of messages can we put out there and how can we put it out there to the wider community or sorry, what, the, the global community? I think, I, think, I think it's about how do you make the message or how do you, you, you articulate the message in a way that's meaningful and resonates. So um, in our case, um, if you look at the products we produce, people don't often understand that even though all these coal mines are being closed, there are new copper mines being developed and new nickel mines being developed and new precious metal mines being developed and new new iron ore mines, even for steel, are being developed. And we're developing a new mine in Yorkshire, North Yorkshire, I should say, there is a difference, um, that will produce fertilisers that will make the agricultural sector more productive. And, and we need to help people understand how we make the world work. You know, if I've got this phone here, 76 different minerals go in the making of this phone. Copper, nickel, 
all sorts of things go into the making of this phone. And literally your house, everything around you comes from the mining industry. And so getting that message, making sure it's accessible, I think is really important. The second thing is the way that we do our work. So today, Anglo-American draws the, the, the energy into its sites. 36% of our energy is now renewable. In 2023, it'll be 56%. In the next seven to eight years, we're actually helping the South African government put in place wind farms, uh, solar, uh, um, solar energy um, uh, assets in the Northern Cape where it's very sunny. We've got these new technologies we've developed to use underground water to pump up and down, use it as a big battery and, and for, fire that. We're converting all of our mobile equipment to, to hydrogen. Our truck, our first hydrogen hybrid truck, 300 tonnes capacity is actually being built as I speak. It took us less time to conceive, design and build this truck than it took Tesla's uh, uh, leadership the first time they, they put their first prototype on the road. Never forget that came out of GMC. It will have done it quicker than they'll have put their first car on the road. Now, from our point of view, that just shows there's a lot of innovation goes on in mining. But that truck will be on the road in South Africa in February next year. And we would then, over the next 12 years, change 400 trucks across the globe to hydrogen, our, our production fleets. So we'll be carbon neutral by 2040. Uh, scope one and scope two. We've also said we'll deliver a 50% reduction in scope three emissions by 2040 as well. So everything we do, as well as the materials we mine, is about how we change people's perceptions of the industry. And we have to explain what we're doing. And the other thing, when we do get feedback and we don't like the feedback, instead of ducking, we've got to stand taller, talk about the issues and work out how we can do those things that people worry about better and continue to improve and it's a journey and, and like everyone we're on that same journey yeah um obviously we've just covered some of this but how do you see the future of mining especially with obviously advances in technology more regulation around esg corporate governance and around obviously the environmental and climate change so um if, if you take a step back uh, again, as a, as a kid, and, and I've got uh, colleagues in, in Anglo-American who have just inspired me in terms of what's possible. But um, um, think about how you can mine differently. So the last 100 years, we've tended to, to, to improve our productivities and costs. Equipment's just got bigger. So if you go back 100 years to mine a pound of copper, or even a ton of coal, if you go back to the old days, or nickel or all these other new products, it takes us 16, we have to move 16 times the amount of rock to get to that one pound of copper. We have to use 16 times the amount of energy to produce that pound of copper, and we use twice the water. So back in 13 and 14 this year, Tony O'Neill and his team in our Anglo-American operations, and he's our technical director, set about the task of working out how we could turn those trends around by being more precise and think very differently around mining and processing and how we get our products to market. And so we're, our target is to reduce our energy consumption by 30%. So turn the clock back 50 years uh, by being smarter and changing the way we operate and then make sure that we connect with people in the community in a very different way, invest in the community, invest in the infrastructure, help them build other commercial activities and then market our products in a very different way. So it touches every part of the business. And so for us, that's about the new and the modern mining industry. So when I talked about my daughter, uh, when you and I were chatting at the start about not wanting to join mining, she, she's uh, working in an in a, um, uh, artificial intelligence startup, loves the job. But I said to her, at some point, we're going to get you into the mining industry because your technology is what's going to drive the future of our industry. And, and I think you bring those two pieces together and, and, you, and that's what you're talking about when you talk about the future of mining 
in, the, on, in terms of the globe and the contribution we can make? Um, to any inspiring CEOs um, that are aiming one day to perhaps be in a similar position as yourself, um, what advice or guidance would you sort of give them? And I know yeah. that's pretty, pretty a big question, but um, I just wonder if there's any advice that you can give, um, no matter what level you're at. Probably not necessarily at a junior level, but a mid, mid to more senior level. Doesn't no matter where you are. I think, I think first up, be in the moment. Um, don't think about the next job. Yeah, it's it's good to plan and think about the way you want to develop your career, but the first and most important thing to do is do your current job well. Be true to yourself, support your people, build trust, do a good job, delivering on your accountabilities and the next job will come. And I think that's the first point. Second point, in all of these jobs, nothing's ever black and white. And so when you're confronted with a tough decision and you do the numbers and it's still not black and white, then trust your gut. Do what's right. Do what feels right. If, if it doesn't feel right, question and think about it and think about the response until you get what feels right. Whenever I've, if, if, if the, the only mistakes, not the only mistakes, but the most significant mistakes I've made in my career over the years is not listening to my gut, not, not listening and, and really relying on your heart instead of your head. You've got to use both your heart and your head to be successful in this world. And if, and, and if it doesn't feel right in your heart, then don't do it. It's about trust. It's about people. And at the end of the day, um, make sure that, that, that it feels right and, and you'll make the right course. Pro develop your career, read, do the technical work, be committed, learn, listen to everyone because everyone's got their own story and they will add value to you. Never be in a place where you think you're the only one who can do the job, who, who knows how to do these things. My success, if, if you talk about you know, where I am today as a role, has been built on the back of so many people who have, who have made or helped me make better decisions because I've listened and their expertise has been more important in making that decision a better decision because you can't know everything. And in most cases, uh, you're, you're not the one who has all the expertise and, and always make sure you're, you're working with everyone, bringing one, everyone into the conversation. But at the same time, when you make the decision, you've got to make it understanding you're the accountable leader and you're accountable. And if it's the wrong call, then fess up, fix it, and move on. Uh, because you're never going to get every call right. And uh, there was a really important study done in the US many years ago on leadership. This is a really important point. And they were trying to measure good leaders versus bad leaders, successful leaders versus unsexual. And that's always subjective because no business has a side. Some of the toughest businesses in the world that are struggling to make a return have the best leaders in the world. So... You know, it's, you've got to be very careful the way you, you define what success looks like in business because it's all relative. Um, and they were trying to work out what's the success rate in the big decisions. And when they did the analysis, and these aren't exact numbers, but they said, you know what? The difference between unsuccessful and successful is about 55% good decisions versus 65% good decisions. And I said, boy, that's a rounding error. Uh, when you look at the analysis, and they said, correct. But what we did notice, or what we picked up in the statistics that we hadn't anticipated, was good leaders make twice as many decisions. And they said, and, and by that I mean, a good leader recognises a mistake and fixes it quickly. Now, being an engineer, I thought about that. And I said, okay, if I make... If I only get 60% of my decisions right in the course of a year, if I fix the bad ones really quickly, then net, net, I could get to about 80 or 90% when I looked at the first set of decisions I made because I'm fixed, I fixed them quick enough so that I've turned, I've turned them into positive decisions. And while that's a little bit nonsensical and a bit silly, and it's me being a bit naughty as well in the process, 
it, it, it actually is an important point because if you can then fix that 40% that you got wrong and adjust it quickly, you'll make a better decision. And so it goes. So if you think in your head, you've got to make a decision. People are look, looking for you to be the leader. Make the calls. But always be alert. They could be wrong. So keep yourself connected. Monitor how they're playing out. And if they're going badly or not going where you thought they should, change. Or if you've made a mistake, admit it up front and fix it. And people will trust someone. There's something more authentic about someone that admits the mistake and doesn't hash around with the words and try and duck and move and says, you know what, I stuffed that one up. Here are the issues, bang, bang, bang. And here's what we've learned. Uh, for me, I think that's a really important part of leadership. And it's what I look for in terms of the high performing leaders that we look for in our business and try and build in our business. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned reading. Is there, was there any books that you, that you could recommend that you may have read during your career that probably changed, changed your mindset or you looked at certain things differently? Yeah, when I was a young, a young leader, a young general manager, uh, a chief executive of the Home State Mining Corporation said, young man, you're my leadership project. And so every six months, he, he, we were running a joint venture in Australia and he came from the US and he'd give me a book. And uh, books included um, African Genesis, Territorial Imperative, the Robert Ardry, A-R-D-R-Y-E-Y, the Robert Ardry series was about the origins of um, um, humans and in particular was about territorial imperative and, and what drove behaviours in people. Now, whether today it's still current doesn't really matter. It, it, it's how you think about things and, and giving you different perspectives on people's behaviour. Any of the work by Elliot Jacques on organisations is a pretty dry read. But quite frankly, it's brilliant uh, in terms of explains um, why the Romans were so successful and through the ages and why businesses have been successful, stratified systems through levels of work. Um, James A. Michener, The Source, uh, The Covenant, talking about uh, civilization and, and, and how civilizations are built, what's important. Um, and you know, Bridget Jones's diary. I mean, you've got to you've got to read everything. You've got to have fun. You read your technical stuff, but the stuff that really makes me think a little bit differently: the worldly philosophers about people, life, leadership, all that sort of stuff. Uh, I find very interesting. I've got two more questions. Um, what would you say is your greatest achievement um, you've made during your sort of your mining career that actually gave you the most satisfaction? Uh, probably two things actually, and, and they sort of connect. Um, the purpose work we did at Angler, I thought was a really powerful piece of work and sort of brings together, you know, 40 years of, of learning into a conversation about who we wanted to be as people and as an organisation. That was really important. And that connected to what I would call the industrialization of our industry. So uh, the work we've done uh, in bringing new operating models, which comes out of Toyota, that sort of work. Uh, and then that connects to this whole technology innovation world. So that package of work for me uh, is the bringing together of a lot of learnings over a number of years, but it's a philosophically different position. And what goes with that is how we're engaging with society. People say, how did you come up with this faith-based work? And I said, well, when you think about it, in many of the countries we work, there's no government, there's no real infrastructure, but the churches are everywhere. And, and they provide a wonderful opportunity in terms of they bring people together, all walks of life, and they provide a different conversation. So it's not about religion, it's about values and belief. So it's that whole package of work and how we're connecting that work to people and communities and, and how we become partners in communities, I think is for me, the most important piece of work I've done. And probably, I'm still coming up a very steep learning curve. And, and that's why I say you never retire. You just move and do different things. And hopefully I can do more meaningful things in my next 45 years. Yeah. And that brings nicely onto the last question. And so what's life uh, like for Mark after, obviously after you fully leave Anglo-American next year? 
Uh, well, as I said, it, uh, you, you don't retire, you just move and do different things. Uh, that, look, there's a couple of board roles probably that I'll do uh, with people that I like and, and would like to help and support them be successful. Um, on a broader basis, energy transition, mining industry, messaging and how we can do things better, technology innovation, all of those areas I think are, are going to provide uh, great pathways to change. Also, from an from a, from a opportunity point of view, there's going to be massive change in the next 10 years and be involved in that and, and play a part in that. For me, it's really exciting. I can both invest and be an investor and at the same time lead work. I don't want to be a, a daily executive. It's more about investing in people and, and supporting and providing guidance. And if I set up some equity structures that might help that, that's where I'll go. But um, this is just moving into another phase of life. Yeah. And I was just going to say from that, is there anything you're going to do more of outside of work if you've got maybe a little bit more time on your hands? So being the world's worst golfer, Seamus uh, <laughs> French and Tony O'Neill uh, are saying that they want me as part of the threesome. Because as Tony said, I don't want to be the last one in the threesome. At least while I've got you there, uh, I'm at least second or first. But uh I think I think uh, they both like being uh, they both like having someone to beat, but I'm determined to win a round against the both of them, and and that's my most important objective in the next 12, 18 months. So a few more, few more rounds of golf then for you, yeah. Mark. Really appreciate your time. Um, thank you for taking the time to. Uh, I, know, I know you've got a busy schedule. Thank you for taking the time to um, share your insights, um, and really wish you well. Um, for your, for the future. Uh, I'm sure the mining community that are listening to this podcast will really appreciate your time. So thank you again. All the best for the future. Um, and yeah, like I said, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to do this. And audience, and our audience really appreciate your time for listening. And until next time, happy mining. <laughs>